Thank you, ladies, singing about the king. I guess that fits in with the kingdom of God we're going to be talking about. Then it kind of fits in with the news, with the new would-be king being born. Wouldn't you know, they call him George. Huh. Well, interesting. I am going to start a, a series of messages on the kingdom of God. Today, um, the mystery of the kingdom of God. Next time, the kingdom of God in the church, and then the ethics of the kingdom of God. Well, if they're going to have a series like that, we must have some kind of introduction. So I'm proposing we look at a few uh, definitions, and then we'll get down to the scripture and really uh, get with the program. Uh, in Luke 8.10, for instance, Jesus says to his disciples, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables. So some people are getting in on what's going on and some people are not. And that has to do with the parables which we're going to be looking at. But it seems as if there were things that God had in mind to bring to pass and they were hidden in times past. And so they were mysterious. But now, with the coming of Jesus, they come into view. And they are no longer secret, as the Revised Standard translates that term. But what is the kingdom of God? If we now know what a mystery is. Of course, we knew what a mystery is anyway. All of you guys are mystery buffs. You know you don't know who done it until you get to the end of the story. Well, the kingdom of God simply, in its most simple terms, means the rule of God. But in biblical writing, it particularly had a, a pertinence to the end time rule of God, the eschatological, last days time. It's an apocalyptic concept. Whew, that's another nice word. Um, you're more accustomed to the word revelation. And uh, you suppose that that means that something is revealed. That would, of course, be true. The underlying Greek word is apocalypsis, and it means an uncovering. What had for formerly been hidden is now uncovered and comes into view. So as you read the book of Revelation, for example, we have uncovered future uh, things that are going to be coming to pass, as the end time events unfold, and then beyond that, what the lovely new life in the new age is going to look like. And that becomes uncovered. <clears throat> now there's another worldly dimension then to this apocalyptic kingdom of God. And I uh, quote the verse I alluded to earlier, many will come from the east and west and sit at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the kingdom of heaven. And so the kingdom will be composed of saved persons whose souls or spirits have been reclothed with new bodies appropriate to the new age. This is the time which we usually call eternity. How do we get into this kingdom? How do we inherit it? Most who inherit the apocalyptic kingdom will do so at the time of their resurrection. I turn to 1 Thessalonians 5.16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the archangel's call, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. What's the probability? Probability is you and I are going to be among the dead by the time it happens. But if we are among the living, this is what will happen. Then those of us who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. In the parable of the sheep and goats in Matthew 25, the king says to the sheep, that is the persons who have fed the hungry, given drink to the thirsty, clothes to the naked, visitation to the sick and imprisoned, come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you 
from the foundation of the world. Not me end with the idea of mystery as I'm doing my definitions. Mysteriously, this end time kingdom reaches back in time to the first appearance of Jesus upon the earth and the beginning of his ministry. And it uh, begins at that point. Both John the Baptist and Jesus preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so it was, it was beginning. It will not be consummated to later. So I'm trying to draw with my hand an idea of an overlap period. We are in this present age and it will go on until suddenly the future age will take over. But at the very last of this, there is an overlap time when the new age has begun and you and I are living in this overlap age. That is the mystery. Now let's go on with the parables. The parable of the soils, first of all. A sower went out to sow, and uh, as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they had not much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell upon thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good ground or soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now the central message of this is this. The seeds in the parables are the words used in preaching the kingdom of God. The soils in the parable are representative of the sorts of persons to whom the gospel is being preached. There are three sorts of those rejecting the message, likened to the hardness of a path, a rocky ground, and being among thorns. There are three sorts uh, who accepted the message, some bringing forth a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, others thirtyfold. Year after year the preachers would preach, year after year his listeners would respond, some accepting the invitation and some rejecting the invitation to enter the kingdom of God. Try as he could, the preacher could never convince 100% of his audience. It was not to be. Now preachers today can also look back at this parable of Jesus and take heart because they are forewarned. Their success will not be full. It will be limited. We need to be happy for those who do respond positively, not simply upset by those who do not come. Ah. Well, how is this to be applied? More important is the taking notice of the basic tasks that confronts the preacher year in and year out. He is busy about the work of preaching, and we must in the church, continue preaching to all those who have heard the Gospels and have yet not accepted it, and those who are hearing it for the first time. We must strive to be ever more effective. But, in the course, in the final analysis, the results are not in our hands. It depends, at least in part, upon those who are listening. We are not to be discouraged. We are to be faithful and continue our labor. What about the work of the congregations? There would be in the audience, in many congregations, someone who would one day respond to the call to enter the ministry of preaching. Given the age of the people in this congregation, I dare say I'm not expecting anyone coming forth uh, to uh, take up at this stage of life preaching. <clears throat> but a few years back, I attended the celebration of 100 years of life in the church in which I was raised, the uh, First Christian Church in Greeley, Colorado. Not all of the Timothys that were alive were there, but there were eight of us who were alive, and, and uh, many of us were there at that time. Every church 
maybe with the exception of this one, has a preacher who was once an ordinary congregational member, but then became a preacher. And we're thankful for all those congregations which gave birth to those uh, responses, uh, positive responses to the call of God. More important for us in here in this congregation is how we support the ministry. On the one hand, that comes about by supporting our own pastor. That's important because particularly as we express our appreciation for his ministry, uh, that is an important way we do it. And the second way we do it is by our offerings because out of those offerings will come the pay to pay the preacher. That way he can devote his time to preaching and not have to work on the side. Another way we do things in our offerings is to support colleges and seminaries as they have part of the expense of uh, educating the ministers who will be preaching in the church. Just before leaving to return to Kansas, Jerry Shreves and I were talking in Cobbs Hall after the church service. <clears throat> he, he felt kind of smug. He told me how he had told Dr. Steve that since Dr. Steve was going to be on sabbatical this summer, he would not mind being back in Kansas. He was going to be back in Kansas anyway, you understand. But that made a good story. And of course, I couldn't let that pass. I said, you mean you don't want to stay and let and hear me preach? And of course, he was chagrined. I must say, I appreciate every one of you who've come out this morning, and you've come out faithfully these past two months to hear all of us, quote, guest preachers, unquote. <laughs> and uh, we, we're, we're thankful for the audience. Let's go on to the parable of the weeds. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field while men were sleeping. His enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then has it weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? He said, No lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Into my barn. All right, how are we to interpret this parable? I like the approach of George Ladd in his book, The Theology of the New Testament. And let me give him credit while I'm mentioning his name for the idea of having this trilogy of sermons which I'm launching into today. He points out that while a parable often has elements which could be allegorized, they really have one central point. And um, that is a truth which must be interpreted in the historical setting of Jesus' ministry rather than the life of the church. Of course, we will later interpret it in the life of the church because all scripture is given, not simply uh, for an antiquarian interest, but for its usefulness today. Now there are irrelevant details in this parable. The identity of the servants, the enemy that goes away after sowing, that the weeds are to be bundled, the sleeping of the servants, that the weeds are gathered first. That's all just part of making up the story, but there are some relevant details field is the world. That means it's not the church. The man is Jesus as he sows the sons of the kingdom. The devil sows the sons of the evil ones. And angels will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and evildoers at the last. Taken together, this simply means that the sons of the kingdom, the good plants, will continue, while all evil and evildoers will not. But there is also this to be noticed. The kingdom has come into history in such a way that society is not disrupted. 
The sons of the kingdom have received God's reign and entered into its blessings. They must live in this age intermingled with the wicked, then at the eschatological coming of Jesus, then the evil will be separated out. That's still true today. There is, today as in Jesus' time, a mixture of good and evil in the world. Even though when God created the world, he pronounced it good. How do we account for that? Surely it is because the men and heavenly beings were created with free will. They had the freedom to do that which was wrong as well as that which was right. And so that has happened. The price of freedom is putting up with the possibility of evil. The battle has been joined between the forces of good and the forces of evil in this overlap period. And we must continue that fight even as we wait for the mop up at the end of time. We of the Jesus movement must do battle. This is going to entail the funding of special projects and um, having special persons to lead the fight in various arenas. We need to combat hunger and disease crime, discrimination, and so the battle is joined. I dare say that there will be occasions when each of us will need to make a personal witness also as we find ourselves in the presence of someone who is speaking in a discriminatory manner, for example, as my daughter did to me the other day. Now I won't, you can ask me about that later. Um, I would be remiss if I did not point out that the church being made up of persons who are in the world, like the world, may very well have some evil within it too. Uh, so we must not be disappointed if we discover something amiss in the context of the church. We may be able to overcome it, and we may not. We may have to tolerate it. In the end, of course, it will be taken care of. We must be active not only battling through the church, I think each of us in a role as citizens must be active as well. Our society undertakes many programs which have to do with law and order and with promotion of general welfare. And we need to do our part to see that good decisions are made and implemented in these areas, active in political matters to the point of avoiding and consulting with those who represent us so that good is done in these areas. All right, that's the two long parables out of the way. We've got two short ones, which I think we ought to be able to do in a shorter length of time. At least that seems logical to me. Parable of the leaven. And again he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until all was leavened. What is the message? Both this parable and the parable of the mustard seed teach the same truth. The beginning of the kingdom is small, just a small bit, but when it is all finished, it is pervasive over all. It is crowded out and transformed all else. How that takes place is irrelevant. What is important is that in the end, the kingdom crowds out all and only it remains. And a quote from Ladd, the emphasis of the parable lies in the contrast between the final complete victory of the kingdom when the new order comes and the present hidden form of what that kingdom as it has now come into the world. One would never guess Jesus and his small band of disciples had anything to do with the future glorious kingdom of God. I would suggest another application. We need also to do our part and look to the Lord God Almighty to see to it that our labor is not in vain. The parable of the pearl. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of a fine pearl, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Well, the irrelevant details here include the identity of the merchant, the search by the merchant, the finding of the pearl, the selling of what he had to buy it. The message of the parable, and also the parable of the hidden treasure, is the same. The kingdom of God is of supreme value and must be sought above all else. So that means you and I must not let anything in our lives be more important 
than our entrance and participation in the kingdom of God. To be sure, in the course of life, <coughs> we must bear children, raise and educate them, save for our retirement, pay for a modest living style. These must be incorporated into our living for the good of the kingdom, rather than being rival purposes. In doing well such facets of living, we of course advance the kingdom of God through the lives of our children, as well as in our own work as disciples in the church and other places of service. But by doing these routine tasks well and with minimal output, we save our energies and our finances to employ them in consequence of being disciples of the Lord Jesus. And so we need to give ourselves to that style of living so that we can participate in that way. I told you that would part would be short, and we're down to the conclusion. Doing well, preacher. Let's look back for a moment, see what ground we've covered. We talked about what meant this idea of the mystery of the kingdom of God, what God had been planning to do in ages past, and what he began to do with the first ministry of Jesus. We considered that the kingdom is the age to come, that those to belong, who belong to Christ will enter it when Christ returns, but we also concentrated on the idea of the overlap area in which you and I are living, that we indeed are already beginning to be in the kingdom of God. The parables then contribute to, to our further understanding. Let me review them in reverse order. The parable of the pearl taught us that nothing is more important than our membership in the band of the disciples of Jesus. The parable of the leaven has taught us that we can confidently go about our ministry knowing that in the end we will be utterly triumphant. The parable of the weeds has taught us that we must do our ministry in a world where both good and evil are to be found. We are not to sit back and wait for God to do everything at the end of time. We must be actively engaged in fighting evil in the present. The parable of the soils emphasized the ministry of preaching the gospel. We must give our support to this effort, supporting those who do this work in our behalf. We are not to be discouraged by failures, but rejoice by success. <clears throat> We're not different than the baseball players. None of them bat a thousand either. Well, the end. In all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you.